something to wear. For the past four years, Mary Miller has called this East Austin Park home. Most of her belongings scattered in tattered plastic bins. And while living on the streets is never easy, she says excessively long heat spells this summer have made life unbearable. I mean, it's excruciating. It feels like your brain is trying sometimes that here it gets so hot. At one point this summer, temperatures in Austin were over 38 degrees for a record 45 days straight, with little reprieve at night. On the day we met, the mercury hit 40. We need to get along and try to help each other. And heat, not eating properly and not resting properly has a lot to do with um, the mentality, how we face and, and deal with people here. Research on the effects of long-term exposure to extreme heat is still in the beginning stages. But early evidence already shows that for every one degree Celsius increase in temperature, there can be a 6% associated spike in rates of violence and up to a 2% increase in suicide. We don't have a certifiable answer to what the cause of that link is. However, we have theories. We know that heat can impact sleep and that sleep uh, when dysregulated can lead to a variety of mental health conditions. Repeat exposure to extreme weather can be particularly detrimental to the nearly 600,000 homeless people in the United States, 20% of whom, according to the National Alliance on Mental Health, are already suffering from a serious mental illness. To make matters worse, research shows that some psychoactive drugs may actually limit a person's ability to sweat or cool, leading to higher death rates among the mentally ill during heat waves. The Hungry Hill Foundation works with the homeless community in East Austin, Please help everybody make food to eat. providing food and water, but also workforce development to help transition the unhoused back into a life of self-sufficiency. Director Kermit Hyder says that while cooling centers help, they're only a short-term solution. What's really needed, he says, is more government funding to get the unhoused permanently off the streets, especially as temperatures continue to rise. Open up the resources because the resources are there. Uh, we're going to continue to have a rising problem of uh, increased uh, unhoused residents, increased unhoused residents dying out here on our streets, in our parks, where our kids play. Earlier this year, a bipartisan group of U.S. lawmakers introduced a bill that would set aside $36 million in grants for mental health care in communities on the front lines of climate change, which could include more resources for the homeless. We need funding, we need political and popular support for these kinds of interventions. And from a research standpoint, we need to have uh, a larger investment in seeing how we can support people who are struggling with the impacts of climate change on their mental health. A need of growing importance. As scientists say, the intensity, frequency, and longevity of this year's summer heat becomes the norm going forward. Unearthing details about the local tick population and the pathogens they carry. Rutgers University's NJ Ticks for Science program has been working on the ground and in the lab since 2021. How you see them when they're really filled with blood, and that's called being engorged. Lyme disease is carried by the black legged tick in the US Northeast and Midwest. But there are also pathogens from other ticks that people should be looking out for across the country. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate up to 450,000 Americans may have developed a meat allergy linked to ticks. Most people don't know much about tick-borne diseases and it really could be impacting them because there's so many ticks here in New Jersey and there's so many different diseases that they could be impacted by because of ticks. And most people only know about Lyme disease when in reality there's many other tick-borne diseases that they could be exposed to. Ticks are patient predators. 
waiting for a host to pass by. But a white woolen mat is effective bait to snag ticks for analysis. In just a couple of minutes, researchers here collected about 15 ticks. They're also asking the local community to document sightings so they can better understand the tick population here in New Jersey. The hope is this research can be used to help better educate people. I know to do preventative measures like wearing the right clothing, treating my clothing before I go out, and then doing a tick check when I come back. And that's the best that you can do. And then, you know, if you feel sick, then talk to your doctor. And if you know the different tick-borne diseases that are, can come from the different species, then you can better, you can ask better questions. And this knowledge might come in increasingly handy. According to the CDC, Lyme disease cases in the US have tripled since the early 1990s. While diagnostic testing has improved and more cases are identified, experts also believe tick populations are on the rise. A lot of people believe that climate, the changes in climate, is one of the major reasons. Uh, and I mean, just to make things very simple, ticks like warmer temperatures. They just do. Scientists say warmer weather could be allowing certain tick species to live in areas previously uninhabitable for them. Experts say there are also other environmental factors. Too many deer, too many unregulated forests with invasive species that make them um, dark and, and very um, um, allow ticks to survive. So we need to be better at managing. There, at this point, the environment, um, <laughs> particularly sort of the northeastern United States is being very, very modified by, by humans. And mosquitoes are also causing a buzz. A few thousand people are typically diagnosed with malaria in the US annually each year. But for the first time in two decades, a handful of locally acquired cases has been reported in Florida and Texas. If you have enough speed, enough of the individuals of, a, of the vector, um, it's going to increase the likelihood it's going to happen, and that's that's it. So the warmer it is, the wetter it is, the bigger the population is, the more likely these kinds of events are happening. Experts say this doesn't suggest an immediate threat. But faced with a warming climate, researchers say the risks posed by vector-borne diseases needs to be monitored closely. Cities are often built on rivers for the ease of transporting people and goods, but that can make them vulnerable to flooding. The Thames Barrier is London's defence against extreme weather events. The original design criteria of the Thames Barrier was to protect against a 1 in 1,000 year flood until the year 2030, but with the analysis that we've done, we think that this structure will give that degree of protection until 2070. The barrier is a series of 10 steel gates, each one able to hold back 9,000 tonnes of water. But its capacity is limited. The Thames Barrier has protected London from flooding more than 200 times since it was built. But it's only designed to close a maximum of 50 times per year. And as sea levels rise and extreme weather becomes more common, its ability to prevent damage is becoming more limited. The barrier will eventually need to be upgraded or replaced. But a decision by the country's environment agency isn't expected until 2040. Experts say the pace of climate change demands action sooner. Sea level rise has accelerated. It's doubled in about the last 40 years, something like that, and it is continuing to accelerate. Now, the Thames Barrier was designed to, to um, deal with a sea level rise of about up to seven millimetres a year, and currently we're at about four. So I think, you know, it's certainly got some life left in it, 
but it's um, being used far, far more often than was originally anticipated. In 2021, the government pledged six and a half billion dollars over six years to reduce flooding around England. But the cost of a new barrier is around 20 billion dollars, and that hasn't been allocated yet. The agency has put together several options for the upgrade, but the plans aren't legally binding. They must first be budgeted by the government and approved by Parliament, and there's no indication yet of when that might happen. It needs to be on a statutory footing, which at the moment it isn't, and also we haven't safeguarded the sites where the barrier needs to come out to the edges of the river, and if you don't do that, then how can you fit a new Thames barrier? The government says it will adapt to changing circumstances, but that change is accelerating, and with it, the threat of flooding is on the rise. Could these climate neutral, gender neutral, multifunctional shapes be the future of the toy industry? The bright, stackable domes are designed to be used again and again as children grow, rather than chucked away to end up at the bottom of the ocean. They're made of a new eco friendly plastic. It's called expanded propylene, so the, exp the, the E in the EPP is the interesting part because we're ex expanding it with pure water steam. So there's no extra like um, toxic things inside. It's pure polypropylene, and by expanding it, we save 96% um, of material per volume. They can also be recycled. Their creator hopes this model could set a mold for the industry. It's a long way, but we are trying to accelerate that movement by showing that it's possible. They may be planet friendly, but they don't come cheap at almost $200 per set. A study from researchers the Insights family, however, found many parents are willing to spend more on eco-friendly products, with two-thirds of those surveyed taking active steps to live more sustainably. 90% of toys worldwide are still made from plastic, and 80% eventually end up in landfills, according to the Yale Environmental Review. Industry leaders have been trying to think outside the box, imagining alternative materials, like this range made from bamboo and plant-based plastics. Well, they noticed that in the toy industry there weren't a lot of sustainable items, but people want that. They want that for their kids, they want them to learn about sustainability, but they also want it for the products that they use daily. While some companies are turning to wood, it isn't a perfect substitute, with deforestation a major contributor to climate change. So many businesses are working to reduce their impact. So we've been planting trees for the last 20 years. So Goki has been planting 450,000 trees in Germany to, I, would say, I don't know if it's the right term, but reimburse what we take away to build the toys we plant back. In recent years, calls have grown for major players to wake up and smell the roses. Lego's been toying with renewable resources and has committed to achieving net zero by 2050. But just last month, it was forced to abandon plans to replace oil-based plastics with recycled ones after finding out this actually caused more carbon emissions, not less. While plenty of brands are making innovative, ecological new products, Marina toys aren't the norm just yet. But with household names promising to do better, the toy industry could produce the building blocks to a more sustainable future. It's off to work for oyster farmer Sheridan Beaumont. Most days she commutes to her job by boat across the wide and windy Hawkesbury River, north of Sydney. And this is our open air office, 
or more specifically, the business that's become a money spinner in more ways than one. For Sheridan just doesn't own the oyster farm here, but runs the restaurant that serves her produce, and which must rate as one of the world's quirkiest eating places. The idea actually came from the pandemic. So basically when social distancing measures came into place, um, I wasn't able to run a viable tour because I'd only be able to have maybe two people on my boat. And so I thought, well, why don't I just pop them in the water and socially distance them that way? It does mean that customers have to don chest-high waders to get to their table, but once in the water, it becomes a fun as well as a gastronomic experience as they open their oysters and sip champagne. I'm a big oyster fan, and yeah, eating them like right where they're grown is yeah pretty magical. It's completely delicious. We're in the most one of the most beautiful places we could possibly be in, and they're super fresh. But there is a more serious side to the success of Sheridan's oyster farm, and it has more to do with climate change than fine dining. One of the key advantages of oyster farming is that farmers don't have to produce the food to get the oysters to grow. And oysters don't produce methane, unlike cattle and sheep. And how thick it Their is. shells also <laughs> play a part. This shell is actually calcium carbonate, and that calcium, um, sorry, that calcium carbonate actually is removing carbon from the carbon cycle. So as we grow these oysters, so long as we don't put their shells back in the river or we put them on land or somewhere safe, you're going to find that you're actually removing carbon from that carbon cycle. And by doing so, you're reducing those greenhouse gases and you're also then going to reduce the effects of climate change. Oysters filter the water naturally, making the environment much cleaner for marine life by removing excess nutrients and other pollutants. They are the kidneys of the river. So as I explained, they're filtering you know, up to 24 litres per hour if it's a really big Pacific oyster, four litres per hour of the Sydney rock. And so they are actually constantly cleaning the waterway and removing any kind of contaminants. Fellow oyster farmer Jason Barry Cotter, who helps out at the restaurant, says oyster farming is not a simple process. We've got um, hot weather, um, we've got floods, we've got um, worm viruses, so clean, washing the mud down. Tourism chiefs have been quick to recognise the potential for this kind of experience. Overseas visitors, many from Asia, have been keen to sample the Hawkesbury's tasty delights. It also suits the sustainability image the Australian tourism industry wants to promote. I think sustainability is just something that's part of everything that we do now. Um, we just like to have that um, undercurrent throughout. Oyster farming and sustainability clearly go hand in hand. And for Sheridan Beaumont, who owns, farms and thought up the idea for this most unusual of restaurants, the world now really is her oyster. Four years ago in this corner of southwest England, the farmer swapped grass for grapes. Potatoes were replaced by Pinot Noir and a host of other varieties at the Camel Valley Vineyard here in Cornwall. Sam Lindo now runs the business started by his parents. They can produce more than a quarter of a million bottles a year with the wine available nationwide. The risk taken in the late 80s has turned into a hugely successful and well-respected business. We were the first producer in England to win a gold medal in the International Wine Challenge um, back in 2005. And yeah, since then we've won a whole host of awards, including Best Sparkling Rosé in the World. I think you know, the higher acidity we get and that kind of really refreshing character is, is really perfect for sparkling wine. And we stumbled across it and have embraced it. As the climate warms, many think the UK is perfectly positioned to be a major player in the wine world. Increasingly challenging conditions in established regions in Europe are forcing producers north. A number of French champagne houses have invested heavily in new vineyards in the south of England. But making them a success is still a significant challenge. It takes the right location, expert knowledge, four or five years and significant investment 
to start producing top quality wine. But despite the many hurdles, it's not putting people off. Hundreds of new vineyards are opening across the UK. The amount of land being used for vineyards increased by 74% over the past five years. More than 12 million bottles are now being produced in the UK each year. Tanhurst Estate is one of those new vineyards. They've just produced their first few hundred bottles of wine. That's expected to grow to 30,000. Dr Alistair Nesbitt is an expert in setting up and supporting new vineyards. He's contributed to a report examining the future of wine production in the UK. It found that growing conditions are starting to mirror what was previously only seen in France. But despite warmer weather, variable conditions remain, with frost, rain and wind all areas of concern. It's a significant shift over a very short space of time. You know, about one degree during the growing season over the last 20, 30 years is, is huge. Um, you know, that's only seven months of the year, one degree warmer. That has enabled a range of varieties to produce very high quality wines that we couldn't have grown, we couldn't have ripened 30 years ago. The variability is going to remain, even though the underlying temperatures increase, and that's where we need the right varieties, the right locations, the right skill set in the vineyard to be able to manage those carefully. Those at Camel Valley think they're now starting to experience weather conditions seen in the Champagne region in the 1950s and 60s and believe the future presents both opportunities and challenges. Things have changed now, there's a lot more Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but what is on the horizon really is um, uh, vines that are more immune to any uh, mould related things like botrytis and mildew. And so these varieties are now becoming more important um, because you know, people don't want to spray the vines and we need to do things that are better for the environment. And also these varieties, you know, with global warming, it has warmed up, but it is a lot, it's becoming a lot wetter, we're getting much heavier rain, so I think there's going to be more of a trend to moving towards varieties that can um, withstand those conditions. UK wine production is still dwarfed by that of the traditional wine regions, but the wine world is starting to realise the future of the industry might be away from those once dominant areas. Mm -hmm.